G'day and welcome to the Bernie Gainer Show. I have a bumper episode for you today. There's a lot to get through. We'll be looking at the insanity behind the increasingly draconian COVID-19 lockdowns in Victoria. We'll head to the US to examine the attack on free communication as the presidential election draws near and understand what this means for Australia. And we'll be asking a very serious question about communist Chinese interference in Australia's anti-discrimination industry, as well as touching on some other important topics. And stay tuned to the end when I announce this week's Goose of the Week. Don't miss it. Let's get started. Dictator Dan really lived up to his name this week. The majority of Victorians have now basically been locked up in their homes. If they do have the courage to venture outdoors, they must not travel more than five kilometres and must be back in home detention within the hour. Right now, the city is under curfew, lasting until 5am. But after that, residents are still being asked to work from home and study from home if they aren't part of an essential service. If they do leave home, people must stay within five kilometres. One hour of exercise is allowed, as is shopping, but only one trip a day for one person from each household. And of course, masks remain mandatory in and around the city. All of this has been done to save lives by the first state in Australia to legalise euthanasia and which has the Western world's most liberal abortion laws. Of course, these laws allowing death were passed because of choice. But the Victorian government is not so much interested in choice anymore. It's interested in controlling people and restricting choice. Now Victorians must get permits to drop their kids off at kindy and are not allowed to buy more than two packets of sausages. Mums that I've spoken to with, with several small children, don't know if they can take them to the shops. They also don't know if they cannot, if anyone else is allowed to come over and look after their kids. Well, they do bravely set out to purchase their allotted rations. Supermarkets themselves don't know much either. First, they were told that distribution warehouses must cut staff by one third because this apparently will prevent the spread of COVID-19. Then they were told that they could keep their warehouse staff and make cuts in other areas of the business. If all of this sounds like amateur hour arbitrariness, that's probably because it is. None of this is based on science or facts. Instead, these decisions and restrictions on time and location and the number of workers have all just been plucked by some bureaucrat and then decreed law by Premier Daniel Andrews. If you want an idea of how this is going to work, and it won't, we don't even need to leave Victoria. Victoria has had the most restrictive COVID-19 measures throughout this farcical period of panic in Australia. And it is the state that has by far the most cases. Victoria is proof that the more the government gets involved in dealing with COVID-19, the worse things will get. Let us never forget that this second wave in Victoria is a direct result of its government's bungled and failed quarantine program. Yet even as the Victorian government is removing freedom, it refuses to answer questions about its central role in this failed program. Victoria's Premier Daniel Andrews won't be called on to give evidence when an inquiry gets underway next week into the state's hotel quarantine fiasco. The first witnesses have been revealed and don't include any government minister or departmental head. Three medical experts will instead be called. They're expected to reveal almost all of Victoria's second wave can be attributed to the bungled scheme. To take things down to the very micro level to demonstrate how farcical things are, let me give you an example. One worker at a Victorian government agency I have spoken to, and who obviously wants to remain anonymous, he doesn't want to lose his job right now for good reason, was issued two face masks this week. He doesn't know when he'll get more. He just knows that his shift lasts eight hours, and each mask has a lifespan of just two hours. The Victorian government's solution the Victorian government workers to the requirement to wear a face mask failed halfway through the first day of restrictions. Given this level of incompetence, it is not surprising that Victorians are understandably sceptical of these restrictions. Another lady I've spoken to is making masks out of curtains to save money. Curtains! It's legal. Will it do anything at all to prevent COVID-19? Who knows? But I'm guessing not. However, that's not the point. 
She's more afraid of the cops smashing her car window in for not having a mask than this disease. And given this is all about appearances, any old rag will do to prevent that problem from occurring. And while it's easy to point and laugh at the Victorian government, it really is more a matter of luck than planning that has kept places like Queensland relatively COVID free. One man I've spoken to who travelled to Victoria for work recently and returned through a Queensland airport found that the list of restricted Victorian localities the Queensland government was screening visitors from was printed out a whole two weeks earlier. Two weeks! Given the rapid spread of COVID-19 in Victoria and the daily changes to affected suburbs, it means that whatever the probably hard-working and sincere defence personnel screening at the airport were doing was, well, kind of pointless. It's not their fault, but it does show that, in general, government projects this image that it's on top of things when the reality is it's filled with ordinary mums and dads who are as confused by things as you, and all of them are led by people with massive egos and an instinct for whatever will give them more power over the rest of us. And they're willing to grab that power regardless of the consequences. And there will be consequences to Victoria's latest round of restrictions. The building industry has been severely restricted. Meat processors will operate at two-thirds capacity. Manufacturing in Victoria will be hit. It is expected that 250,000 Victorians will have stopped working this week. All of this will hurt Victorians. It will impact the rest of Australia as well. Victoria produces 20% of Australia's beef, 40% of its lamb. Its ability to keep doing this has just been slashed. Daniel Andrews, however, says not to worry. You may not necessarily be able to get exactly the cut of meat that you want, but you will get what you need. Right. You can't get what you want, but you can get what Daniel Andrews has decided that you need. One person at a time, once per day, with reduced supply. This will obviously have consequences. Okay, so so what what are we expecting? You know, for the for the people at home, Evan, is you know, is meat going to be more expensive? Uh, I know there's already been a lot of talk about you know the prices of lamb driving up. Is this what we yep. can expect to see in, in supermarkets? Yes, yes, it is. It's, it's simple economics in terms of the fact that we don't have the same amount of supply that's going to be on yeah. the supermarket shelves. It will therefore drive up prices. Tell me again why we are doing this. Oh yeah, COVID nineteen. Well, here's a fact. COVID-19 has killed 255 people in Australia this year. That is undoubtedly sad and a tragedy, but the response to this disease is entirely out of proportion to the risk we now know it poses to the vast majority of the population. Here's another fact. During this same time period, approximately 400 Australians have died in road accidents. That's also sad and a tragedy. And these accidents have killed far more fit, healthy and young Australians than COVID-19 ever will. More importantly, this happens every single year. Indeed, if you are under 40, you have far more risk of dying on the road than you do from COVID-19. Yet, if we took the same public safety approach to road deaths as we are for COVID-19, the government would ban cars. Actually, given the way things are going, that might not be too far away. The shocking blast in Beirut this week was just terrible. Reports now indicate that 300,000 people have been left homeless and so far 157 have been confirmed dead. This number is likely to rise significantly with over 5,000 people injured. Our thoughts and prayers are with all those suffering in this city, and I'd like to pay tribute to the firefighters who died at the scene of the blast while attempting to put out the fire that led to the explosion. Regardless of whether these firefighters were in Beirut, at the World Trade Centre, or firefighting bushfires here in Australia, these men and women are all brave and deserve our thanks, as do police and ambulance officers and defence personnel. Thank you. This week, President Trump made this statement. If you look at children, children are almost, and I would almost say definitely, but almost immune from this disease. So few, it's, they've got stronger, hard to believe, I don't know how you feel about it, but they have much stronger immune systems than we do somehow for this. And they do it, they, they don't have a problem. They just don't have a problem. President Trump made that statement in relation to questions about whether schools in America should reopen after their summer holidays. President Trump's 
President Trump's view is that yes, they should. Others have different views. For instance, the Los Angeles Teachers Union released a document in July claiming that it was unsafe to reopen schools at the moment due to COVID-19. It went on to state that defunding the police would make things safer and allow schools to reopen. No one really knows how that makes any kind of sense, but in these times it would seem that any statements pointing out children are the least vulnerable people to COVID-19 are simply not acceptable. Certainly, Facebook and Twitter decided that President Trump's statement was not acceptable and must be deleted. So that is just what they did. They deleted President Trump's interview. Facebook said that his video includes false claims that a group of people is immune from COVID-19, which is a violation of its policies around harmful COVID-19 misinformation. Twitter issued a similar statement. Now, there are a few problems with all of this. Firstly, last time I checked, Twitter and Facebook were not medical companies, but social media tech giants. Their expertise in matters medical is not just questionable, it's non-existent. So they have no expertise to decide what is harmful COVID misinformation. Secondly, if you want to find all sorts of weird conspiracies, like the one that germs aren't real and COVID-19 isn't even a thing, then all you have to do is go to Facebook. Look up someone like Kelly Brogan. There are any number of bizarre Facebook or Twitter accounts promoting bizarre ideas about COVID-19. These tech companies have done precisely nothing about them. They have only decided to censor the US president. Which brings us to the third and most important point. Twitter and Facebook are not medical experts. They're not even practicing what they preach when it comes to other pages on their platforms, which means that they are using COVID-19 as an excuse to restrict communication from President Trump. Let's call this what it is, political censorship. It might not, it might not be government censorship, but that makes no difference. And the US government and ours here in Australia should do something about it. These companies, with their huge monopoly over the expression of ideas in our society, should not be allowed to shut down conservative communication. But that is what they are doing because they hate conservative ideas. They are also afraid that Trump will roll back the protections that they have been given which exempt them from defamation laws and their liability to hoover up huge amounts of data on each one of us. So these companies are now actively using their increasing monopoly over communication to silence a sitting American president. They can do this to Trump, they can do it to you. It is one reason why you should sign up to emails from goodsource.news. That way, if we are ever shut down by Facebook or Twitter, you will still be able to hear from us. Fourthly, what President Trump said is borne out by the facts. The Australian government's COVID-19 website basically echoes what President Trump said, and this is what it says. At this stage, the risk to children and babies and the role children play in the tr transmission of COVID-19 is not clear. However, there has so far been a low rate of confirmed COVID-19 cases among children relative to the broader population. So President Trump is right. It is safe to open schools. Facebook and Twitter just don't want you to hear it. Is the anti-discrimination industry in Australia being manipulated by the communist Chinese government? Surely not. What chance would there be that the thought police, filled by little Stalins and Mao's, could be manipulated by, sympathetic to, or even working for a foreign communist regime? Well, let's look at some facts. Earlier this year, on June 1 to be exact, the president of the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board issued a press release claiming that there had been an increase in racism complaints this year due to COVID-19. It claimed that, shock horror, they had received an average of four racism complaints per week. Four, since the pandemic began. There was no detail about who had made these complaints, if they were verified, or even what they are about. For all we know, four people with nothing better to do could have fired off a complaint a week against people making jokes about the Kung flu or stating that COVID-19 came from Wuhan. That same day, June 1, a Guardian Australia article claimed that anti-discrimination New South Wales has recorded a surge in anti-Asian racism during the coronavirus pandemic. And then on June 9, eight days later, the ABC reported that the Chinese government had issued a travel warning about Australia, stating, China's Education Bureau has taken the rare step of warning Chinese students about studying in Australia when campuses are set to resume classes in July due to racist incidents during the coronavirus pandemic. 
Now, this was all rather convenient for China in the middle of rising tensions over its interference in Australia's domestic politics and its heightened military posture in the region. Thanks to the thought police, this communist regime could now pretend that Australia was the bad guy. If nothing else, this proves that the communist Chinese government does pay attention to Australia's anti-discrimination industry. And it should. These guys are its friends. But it got me thinking, just how possible would it be for China to manipulate the thought police for its own purposes, or even infiltrate this system? And the answer is obvious. It would be very easy. For a start, this industry basically only employs socialists. It's also designed to be used for political purposes. The anti-discrimination industry does not solve problems. Its sole reason for existence is to score progressive political points. Its mission in life is to use the coercive power of the state to impose cultural Marxism on society. That's why in New South Wales, it's free to lodge complaints. There's no penalty for false or vexatious complaints. Investigations are secret. And you can only complain about things that socialists care about. All of this means that it is entirely possible that the communist Chinese government has directed agents in Australia to lodge complaints with the thought police to ensure that this system will inevitably spit out the reports about anti-Chinese racism. None of the complaints need to be verified for that to happen. It's even possible that it has agents working in this system to ensure it gets the outcomes needed to support anti-Australian propaganda and to undermine our national interests. Would this be as high a priority as, say, infiltrating defence or our intelligence agencies? Obviously not, but the payoff would still be substantial for very little outlay or risk. This problem would go away if this entire rotten industry was dismantled. Unfortunately, that won't happen because even conservative politicians are afraid to attack the clear problems in this industry. So, in the meantime, ASIO should conduct a risk assessment of the threat of foreign influence or manipulation posed to the anti-discrimination industry, and they should do it now. This industry has already been used by China to attack Australia. I have raised this issue with a number of politicians and I hope that this threat is taken seriously. Staying on the topic of human rights, the Satanic Temple in America has just released details of the Satanic abortion ritual. Why? Well, because it wants to use religious freedom laws, the same kind of laws that are being promoted now in Australia, to ensure access to abortion. There is nothing good or holy about abortion, it always involves killing an actual human being, but it makes perfect sense for Satanists to claim this act is central to their religious beliefs. It's basically child sacrifice. There is evil and Satanists worship it. Now they're being open about it to win court cases. The Satanic Temple claims that its religious abortion ritual means that Satanists should be legally exempt from mandatory waiting periods, counselling, ultrasounds, or even listening to the heartbeat of the child that is about to be sacrificed. We should take note of this. Human rights laws and the human rights industry always ends up being used at the end of the day to protect evil and lunacy while simultaneously limiting the freedom of normal people. There is a philosophical reason for this. Anti-discrimination law ignores truth. It pretends that all ideas are equally valid. It means that it necessarily places error and evil on the same level as truth and goodness, and that always ends in disaster. It gives freedom to evil, and evil always uses whatever it means it can, especially force, to suppress and destroy what is good. That is why I'm opposed to the Commonwealth's proposed Religious Freedom Act. If it is passed, we will see similar legal challenges in Australia, and indeed, we already have. The very first religion protected by the Australian Capital Territories religious vilification laws that were passed three or four years ago, was a satanic cult that follows the writings of a man who claimed that the most perfect form of sacrifice was a young boy. I'm not making this stuff up. You now cannot criticise this religion without risking a court case. Before we wrap this up, I need to mention Israel Folau. He is in the news again for refusing to kneel in solidarity with the so-called Black Lives Matter movement. This is the movement that has spawned violence across America and criticises things like the nuclear family structure on its webpage. Given Folau is not white, I would assume that he was perfectly entitled to make this decision, but apparently not. Peter Fitzsimons, 
who wanted Folau sacked for expressing his views off the field, is now critical of Folau because he didn't join in the protest on the field. Fitzsimons tweeted this week that Israel's decision to stand tall, uh, he tweeted this, It still takes my breath away, Fitzsimons said. Seriously, Israel, the downside of expressing solidarity with a movement that believes we are all equal and deserves equal treatment would be... And then he followed that up with another tweet stating, What would God want? The God I remember from Pete's Ridge Sunday School would be on the side of those taking action to defend those being bullied. Just a thought. Speaking of bullies, more than 700 police were injured in the first 10 days of rioting in the United States. It's been going for weeks now, months. Many more have been injured since. And now that police have been removed from the streets, robberies, shootings and murder in America has skyrocketed. Peter Fitzsimons is right. Christ would not be on the side of the bullies. But, unlike Pirate Pete, he would also be able to work out which side that was. For his hypocrisy, the huffing Peter Fitzsimons gets my Goose of the Week award. That's it from me. I'll be back next week. Stay tuned for that. Thank you for your support. If you like the work GoodSource.News is doing, please like, please subscribe, please sign up to support our work. We cannot do it without you. Uh, you may have missed the fantastic interview uh, George Christensen did with Cardinal Zen talking about freedom in China. You can catch it on the GoodSource.News website. And of course, tomorrow, the wonderful Corinne Barraclough will have a, another episode. Uh, she'll be interviewing a very brave psychologist from London talking about the attack and threat family law poses to fathers. Uh, stay tuned for that. The Bernard Gaynor Show is a production of The Good Source, hosted by Bernard Gaynor. To watch, listen to, or read more content without the SJW PC fact filter, visit goodsource.news. Good, S-A-U-C-E dot news. Become a Good Source supporter for exclusive access to live and unedited interview recordings, including the conversations before and after the show.